So I was doing that little tease. Oh, that's that right. little mark with the A and then the ring around it. At? See, that's what I said. Mm -hmm. um, Katie said she thought it was about. Yeah. Oh. But I'd never heard or it. Around I'd never heard it about. said. I'd always seen around. the mark, but never yeah. heard it said. And then yeah. it sounded stupid when I said it. Violence at NBC. <coughs> yeah, I heard around big or about. in the lunchroom the See, week. <laughs> there it is. Violence at NBC, GE com. I mean, well, what Allison should know. What, what do you is say internet about anyway? Internet is uh, that massive computer right. network, mm -hmm. the one that's becoming really big now. What it's, do you mean that's big? How does one, what do you write to it, like mail? No, a lot of people use it and communicate. It, I guess they can communicate with NBC writers and producers. Allison, can you explain what internet is? No, she can't say anything in 10 seconds or less. Oh, <laughs> oh. Allison will be in the studio shortly. What, is, what does it mean? It's a, it's a giant computer network made up, made up of, uh, started from... Oh, I thought you were going to tell us what this was. It's like a, look a in computer the dictionary. billboard. It's not, it's, it's not a new. It's, it, it's, it's a computer billboard, but it's nationwide. Right. And it's, it's several uh, universities and everything all joined together. And right. And others can access it. And, right. And it's getting bigger and bigger all the time. Just it came great. in really handy during the quake. A lot of people, that's how they were communicating out to tell family and loved ones they were okay because all the phone lines were down. I was telling Katie and I was but you don't need But you don't need that? You don't need a phone line to operate internet? No. No. Happy Bitcoin Tuesday, freaks. It's your boy, Matt O'Dell, here for another Citadel Dispatch. That clip you just listened to was not a recent clip, if you couldn't tell. That was the Today Show in 1994. Katie Couric, Brian Gumbel, and Elizabeth Vargas, the anchors of the Today Show, completely confused about what the internet and email was. Um, there seems to be a little bit of confusion uh, with the cringe level of the mainstream media clips I play at the beginning of every Citadel Dispatch, um, the intention is for them to be a bit cringy. Uh, I expect them all to age about the same way that um, that Today Show clip has aged since 1994. So it should be a pretty fun thing to go back and look at. Uh, Citadel Dispatch is the interactive live show about Bitcoin distributed systems, privacy, and open source software. Huge shout out to the ride or die freaks who continue to support the show and keep it ad free, sponsor free, and strictly focused on actionable Bitcoin discussion. The easiest way you can support the show is downloading a podcasting 2.0 app. Uh, my two favorites are Fountain Podcasts and Breeze. You can just load it up with Sats, search to the dispatch. And then you can stream sats directly to my lightning node. You can also support the show at sildispatch.com, um, either through uh, lightning on my tippin account or through my pay name, which is Odell. Very easy to remember. Uh, also, a huge shout out to the Rider Dies who consistently come in for our live chat, which you can access on Twitter, Twitch, or YouTube. Uh, you guys make the show truly special. Uh, and unique, and uh, I couldn't do it without you. So thank you guys. With all that said, I'm excited to introduce our guests for today's episode. Um, we have return guest Waxwing coming in from El Salvador. Uh, he's one of the lead maintainers of the Join Market Project, uh, and I'm very happy that he's joining us again. And we have uh, Raw Avocado here, Alex. Um, we will be discussing secure random number generators, uh, why that is important when you're using Bitcoin and encryption, and what you can do to mitigate the risks associated with it. How's it going, guys? Good. Yo, what's happening, motherfuckers? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I meant, yeah. <laughs> um, I actually realized uh, I messed up the intro a tiny bit. Um, for our freaks joining through our podcast streams, uh, it's important for them to associate a voice to a name early on. Um, so Waxwing, why don't you say hi to everybody? 
Hi, this is Waxwing. I am in sunny El Salvador, where there are seven active volcanoes and military roaming the streets and uh, Bitcoiners roaming the streets trying to pay for lightning. Uh, and it's all very surreal and it's great. Are there really military in the streets? <laughs> well, I mean, if you if you walk around the city, you're going to see men with very, very large guns. Quite a lot of them. Yeah. <laughs> wow. I guess they're taking it seriously. They don't want any. Well, incident. there was a bunch of murders a few days back, so you can't really. <laughs> Yeah. Well, stay safe out there. We don't want anything to happen to you. Um, Alex, why don't you say hi to the freaks? Yo, yo, what's happening, freaks? I mean, how can I beat that? What am I going to say now? <laughs> I'm, in north, I'm in north of UK. It's fucking foggy. <laughs> Nothing is happening. A cow farted. That's the highlight of my day, you know? How can I beat what he's doing? Well, I think I, I don't even speak. contribute to anything, by the way. I don't even contribute to anything. So You contribute to the, the world's knowledge, Alex. You contribute greatly. Don't, don't, don't put yourself down well i think i can speak for both me and alex that we're very jealous uh that waxwing is in el salvador i was sorry i couldn't make it work um so with all that said i mean i think a good spot for us to start here is uh why is secure random generation important with respect to bitcoin like why should the freaks even care um i actually would go i would just start off like first of all bitcoin is a cryptocurrency and in case you probably didn't know this, if you're spending a lot of time on Twitter, but crypto stands for cryptography, and cryptography most of the uh, most of the time has to do with the uh, secrets and sometimes authentication, and other things. And the way these secrets are maintained and uh, preserved is through mathematics that can't get inverted most of the ways, uh, and uh, random numbers. So anything that uses communication uses cryptography. So it needs random numbers. Now for Bitcoin, even more so, considering that cryptography is what runs on it, it needs it. And it needs it in multiple places. It needs it when you generate your private keys. And it also needs it when you sign transactions. Uh, because both of these operations, if, if those random numbers aren't really ran random, uh, an adversary could possibly guess your keys. That's how I would answer this. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Yeah. It's the it, connection's not great, so I'll be coming in and out. But I'm here now. <laughs> did you did you hear Alex just now? I saw the I saw I heard the end of it. Uh he's describing what you need random numbers numbers for. So I mean basically and correct me if I'm wrong, um the process of generating private keys whether that's for encryption or if that's for Bitcoin Mm -hmm. um involves a source of entropy to make them secure and when we talk about entropy we're talking about randomness true randomness yeah and if you don't have that true randomness if your if your uh entropy is compromised or poor just not good randomness uh that can be used against you to basically have someone else regenerate the same key as you and and compromise you right like that's the the million dollar question that almost every newcomer to bitcoin asks is you know i just generated this bitcoin key offline uh how do i know that someone else isn't going to uh generate the same key as me right that's like an i remember early on when i first started with bitcoin that was like the number one question people were asking yeah it's a, it's a natural source of uh uncertainty because it strikes at the very heart of the security of what you're doing doesn't it yeah and um i, I do want to mention there's a nuance with because i think alex was saying you need it for both the the key the private keys and and the signing and the signing operation still needs what you might call cryptographic randomness but um there's a nuance where you can kind of get cryptographic randomness sort of second hand where you can kind of seed what's called a uh, a pseudo random number generator, but a, a, a generator that will generate a bun uh, like an endless stream of random data from a starting seed, uh, according to some complicated algorithm, which we might get into later. But but I'm just trying to say that the process of getting like, so to speak, raw randomness from the environment, from your operating system, from something like that, that's one thing. And then there's a lot of actual of the random strings that you're using in cryptographic protocols are actually not coming directly from that because it's kind of hard to source masses of randomness right so you might just have like uh, 
know if that really helps anyone saying that, but I just thought I'd say it. We lost you at the very end, right after might. What, what were you saying there? You might have. Um, uh, you, uh, uh, I'm not sure. I'm sorry. Uh, that there's. Did I, did you get the point about that? That you might yes. see a random number generator, and it might produce a long string of randomness out of that. Um, oh, okay. It's, it doesn't matter. It's not important. Please go on. Right. I mean, but the, there's a key element here, right? Is mm -hmm. is so when you're so if if you are, um, let's say you're using Bitcoin Core, right? You're using Bitcoin Core on your computer, and you create a new wallet. Um, where does that entropy come from? Right. So, Alex, do you want to take that? Yeah, I, I even made a, a Twitter thread about this, actually, about how Bitcoin Core specifically does this. Uh, long, so the thing is, like, there are multiple sources of entropies you can have, right? And usually the more, the better. And the um, good sources of entropy on your on your computer, pretty much, are things that uh, are information that your computer does. For example, how does the disk move? Or... Um, Another thing would be like the timing interruptions between the disk or even the timing interruptions between your keyboard and your clicks, right? Or how resources are used by your processor and your kernel and all this weird stuff, right? Because these things like, they, they are still deterministic things, but it's very hard for someone to, to measure them. So this would be like one type of, of sources of entropy and we can call these like dynamic events. Another source of entropy could be your processor because all the modern processors that we have today they have a built-in uh pseudo random they have a they have a thing built in that gives you random numbers right and the way bitcoin core does it it takes all it takes all the sources i've mentioned before it takes also these things for the process it mixes them in a very interesting way uh, mostly it has to do using the the binary operation SOAR, and we can explain that, what it is or whatever. But the, the SOAR thing has very a very interesting magic property that if you have... So let's say I, I have two sources of entropy, right? And um, one of them is compromised. Like, it's it, you literally, you know exactly what it is. And one of them is real entropy, right? It's good. If you SOAR this thing together, uh, this... I'm just going to end up with the, the best entropy. So... so Sorry, what I'm trying to say is that this cannot bad entropy when you sort it with good entropy it doesn't it doesn't cancel it out. So Bitcoin Core uses multiple sources like this, and it's a bit more complicated, by the way. You can check the thread if you want. I even draw it out, and you you, you jumble these things a lot of times, and you hash them together, and you sort them together, and that's how it gets. So, sense. so to repeat, when whenever we say entropy in this in this conversation. You can the freaks can basically replace that with a source of randomness. Um, the I, I I before we we're gonna dive very deep in this conversation. I want to be very clear that you might get very scared or frightened from the conversation. You know, take a deep breath. Uh, fortunately, we haven't had many compromises in this respect. We have had some, and we are going to talk about that. Um, but it's something that's very important in terms of actually using Bitcoin in a sovereign way and holding your own keys and making sure your keys are secure. Um, so when we're talking about entropy, when we're talking about sources of entropy, the key is to have randomness that is distinct and unique and can't be basically uh, re-simulated or recalculated on someone else's machine or device, right? Yeah, notice it's not just distinctness or uniqueness, right? Because, well, it's not just uniqueness. Because if I if I use the private key, one hundred and fifty four, that's that's unique. Nobody else has done that, but that's because nobody else is stupid enough to do that, right? So the the, the point there is, I'm trying to make is that uh, the concept of entropy is think of it like disorder, like um, one one measure. I, I won't sort of get into the technical details, but one one way of measuring the randomness of some string of data you know of bytes on your, uh, a list of uh, characters or bytes is um can you compress it right because if if i just write the character a a a a a a 50 times it's a very long string but it actually almost basically no entropy because i can take that whole string and i can just express it as a times 50, which is a much, much shorter string algorithm that expresses that string 
shorter than it originally was, then it didn't have perfect entropy or it didn't have entropy, if that makes any sense. So think of it as it should be disorder. Oh, oops. Can you, I'm, I've lost you again. Yeah, right, so kind of in and out there, but I, I, it actually kind of the part that didn't necessarily uh, <laughs> lost any information. Uh, sorry, Matt, you were going to say something. I was going to add something to what you said. No, add. Go ahead. So, uh, actually, the thing is like, hello. So, you have this. Let's see. Yeah, we can hear you now. Sorry, oh, I God. could also hear myself. I think. No, yeah, we hear we you cut out a little bit, but it seems like it just lagged and then we heard we heard what you wanted to say. Cool. Oh, yeah, that was to, good. to the freaks, uh, Waxwing's <laughs> joining us from El Salvador and he's on hotel Wi Fi. So, we're gonna make this work because it's an important conversation. Yeah, did you, did you get the Alex? Go on. Oh, what I was not. Oh, yeah. sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Alex. Yes. Yeah, so, so, so to reiterate what you said, in case uh, so you will know what we heard. Uh, Westwing was saying if you have uh, the the string that has fifty A's, right? There's not you can compress this a lot. There's not that much entropy. There is just a fifty times, so you can write in a very short format. But uh, to, to to bring a bit more home, what we're just trying to say. So let's say you have something. It's a program. It's a computer. It doesn't fucking matter what it is. It's something that whenever you press the button, it just spits out a lot of numbers, right? gibberish right so then what would be good entropy what would classify as good entropy well there's three main characteristics of this first of all it's unpredictability okay meaning that if i have like two of if i look at this at uh, this thing i can't predict what it's going to do in the future because i predict my private keys i don't want matt and and wax and someone else to predict my my private key so the first one is pre predictive unpredictability the second property is going to be uniform distribution what does this mean Yep. It means that if we would take like these numbers and we would chart them out, they would literally look like, uh, you know, when you have the television and there's like perfect noise and there's static, it would literally look something like that. Like the, the, there's no pattern. There's nothing you can say about this. It. That's why it's random. It's complete gibberish. So there's unpredictability and uniformity. And then there's lack of patterns in this sequence. You, you don't want to have any, any patterns here. Now, worth in, uh, noting here that free implies both right both one and two because if you have lack of patterns there's there, of course there's going to be a uniform distribution and it's going to be unpredictable but one doesn't imply two because you can have something that's unpredictable but it's not uniform distributed and two does not guarantee one because even if something is uniform distributed doesn't mean it's unpredictable i know that it sounds a bit like concorded but i think that would be the the simplest way i can compress like what would make good entropy mm. i hope that makes yeah. sense it's yeah yeah, there's there's also a thing about how you know you said unpredictability. That's a very that's the difference between random numbers and cryptographically secure random numbers. Is like I could make a string of data that's completely random. Well, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, you're can all you good. Me? Yeah, we hear you. Uh, we hear you. I, I, I can make a string of uh, I can make a stream of random numbers that that to the outside world looks totally random. But if somebody knows the algorithm that's used to generate the random numbers, then they might be able to predict the next sequence of numbers that comes after it. And it actually works backwards in time as well, which is kind of weird. If you want to make it cryptographically secure, it should also be the case that looking at the current stream of random numbers, I should not be able to go backwards in time and find out what was in the previous set of random numbers in this long stream. So that's that's that's, and I think that's part of what what Alex is saying. And that is, his point about there not being a pattern is is probably the best overall um, concept to remember. Yeah. Well, okay. Let's let's still mend this this point even more. So. The thing is, like, when you hear the word entropy, this comes, like, the, I, I, I like, this is how I think about it, by the way, so I don't feel like there's a rigorous difference. But I think there's three types of entropy. First of all, there's the physical one, which that's where yeah. the word comes, and it expresses the second law of thermodynamics, and it has to do with molecular randomness. So you have, I don't know, you have, so you imagine you have a fart, and the fart is compa uh, composed of little tiny things, right? And, and those tiny things, like, go around it. There's a lot of, like, chaos, right? You don't know what's happening there. Then there's the informational theoretical uh, context, which is what we described right now, which is something you can measure. And to measure this, Shannon invented this uh, uh, unit yeah. to measure this because he was trying to measure information. So just, that's just what we describe right now, which just says something theoretical about these things. But then there's the cryptographical context, which what is cryptography? Well, cryptography is just adversarial math, which means that we, we, we take what we just said but we judge this from the perspective of how hard it is for an adversary to, to guess this. What do I mean? So all these things that, I, that we enumerated earlier, you can take, the, you know, pi. 
pi is this this number that goes on forever, right? And it doesn't repeat itself. So, so if you if I would take like I don't know the uh, we have calculated something around sixty two trillion digits of pi or something like that. I don't know. So if I would take like the hundredth million digits from now on, I would give it to you guys. You'd be like, oh, this looks random enough to me, right? This is perfectly fine. You would take all these boxes, but it's not cryptographically secure because, well, it's the number pi. So what Westwing was saying, like, hey, I could realize this is pi, and now I could see what your what is gonna what the other ones are gonna be, and so on. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, it's important distinction. It's subtle, but it's really important. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, so, I mean, I think, I, I, I think it would be so. So every every Bitcoin wallet, whether it's a software wallet, whether that's a wallet on your computer, something like Bitcoin Core or Sparrow Wallet, or if it's a hardware wallet, something like Cold Card or Seed Signer. Um, the the key is when they're generating your keys is, is that they're trying to have the secure randomness, the secure entropy when they're generating the keys. It's, it's, it's the most important thing they do. Um, and they will source that from multiple different ways. If they're, if, if they're a well-designed wallet, right? Because if you have one issue, can I just um, on that point? Can I just interrupt on that point? Yes, Alex, interrupt me whenever you want, Wax Wing. Alex explained that very beautifully at the beginning about how it's like looking into the operating system. It's looking at different things like the hard disk, the the CPU, and so on. Uh, is it using? Uh, are you are you talking about what comes out of DevView Random? Uh, am I right about that, um, Alex? On at least on Linux. Okay, uh, you know, you know what? It would be really good if you would have that picture. So the thing is, like the uh, so okay. what is this random? Dev, so when you have the Linux, a Linux, uh, uh, shall, shall we go and explain this, or should I just answer the question? Uh, or explain, go, go okay. for it. So, so Dev Rand, so if you ever, it's a Linux in Linux, everything uh, is a file, and there's this specific, the very special file which which you, it, you can access it at slash dev slash random, and uh, this file takes care of entropy. So the, you know the people who design Linux, they're like, hey, you know what, guys, we should like we should like create something in the kernel. And the kernel is like the the the, the main thing there that, uh, that 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 generates random numbers because we need random numbers everywhere. Now the problem is that th th and this was invented in 1994, by the way. Um, and the thing is, like when they did, computers were very different back then. And when they did this, they realized that. And by the way, there weren't like random number generators on processors. Uh, they were like, we need to we need to find some sources that that uh, are are very easy to, to use and don't depend on special hardware or whatever. So that's how they designed this thing. And um, and then, uh, so, so they, they had this model where they have mo these multiple sources and do this. Now, Bitcoin Core, uh, because it was designed pretty recently, it, it does have multiple sources of entropy, but it's a bit more elegant in the way it mixes them up together. And I, I hope I'm not saying something wrong, but uh, this would be called, this is like what uh, Fortuna would be this type of algorithms called. And this is like more modern ones and it's also what BSD uses. Right, so, it's, okay, go ahead, yeah. Well, yeah, that, that was it. Um, okay, so, <laughs> So you, we, we, now, we now have chips that are designed purposely to create, uh, you know, they, 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 they claim to create secure random numbers, right? Um, and a lot of some, some software and some hardware will just rely purely on those. A uh, perfect example is, I believe, Ledger, right? If you use like a Ledger hardware wallet, they have a chip on there and they're deriving the entropy from that chip that's purpose built to derive entropy. Some wallets will give you the option to add additional environmental entropy, stuff like dice rolls, pictures, um, you can either use that entropy specifically. We lost Waxwing. He'll be back in a second. Um, or you can combine that with other entropy. Um, am I correct in that explanation? You are very correct. Uh, that's how things work. But um, I would so so the thing is like 
your wallet, it's like your instrument that you use to interact with a Bitcoin network. So it has to do all these things. And we already established, that's why we've been talking for the past 10 minutes, that this is an important um, uh, operation. So it takes care of this. And so most of the wallets by default take care of this. And you're very right. Uh, most of the... the uh, the hardware wallets are, are built on like m uh, microcontrollers, which are just from very dumb computers. And these very dumb computers have indeed a, a chip that's supposed to take care of random number generation or whatever. Um, now, the thing is that you have a problem of trust and, and in multiple ways. First of all, how do you know that these people are saying what they're doing? Uh, and how do you know that even if they're saying what they're doing, when you get home, you actually got a device that's supposed to do this. So that's why some wallets, uh, cold card. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, is Coca is a good example. They allow you to add your own entropy. And another good example, which is my new uh, favorite project, I'm I'm a very big fanboy, is the Sid Signer, that allows you to um, that that allows you to, uh, to to even take pictures, right? So 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 the reason you would have the, this like your uh, these personal sources of entropy, if we can call them, is just because you you want to eliminate the possibility of trusting anything, you know? Right. When you use something like Ledger, you're purely trusting that chip to generate your entropy for you. If you add environmental entropy, if you if you use seed signer and you take a picture of something that's not on the internet, you take a picture of anything, it can take randomness from that picture. Uh, and you know, like someone wasn't in like your bedroom closet taking a picture of, you know, your shoes or something. Right? Um, or you can use something like cold card where they allow you to add dice, uh, or use strictly dice. So cold card has like two methods. You can either add dice, you can use their chip plus dice, or you can just use dice. Um, if you just use dice, I guess there is a concern there when, if you just use dice, there's a concern that maybe the dice aren't sufficiently random. Th that's a myth. That that doesn't make that, that's just a stupid meme that people pass around. You can mathematically, I mean, like I'm proving in five minutes that that doesn't make any sense if you want about dice not being random enough. Yo, Waxwing, try and speak. Hello, can yeah, we can hear you. Oh, why is it? I must, oh, it's like the interface thing, right? Uh, no, I didn't actually want to say anything. I was just, it just had a little button that I was muted. Um, yeah, Blacksmith thought he was muted. I did mute you for a second when you first joined. There was a little bit of an echo, and then I unmuted you. Um, so it might have been my fault. Um, so, I mean, I think what would be useful here is let's go through like the history of backdoors, compromises, poor implementations of, of entropy sources, randomness. Um, and then after that, we can jump into like actionable. Uh, mitigations in way that ways that freaks can, uh, you know, make sure that their keys are secure. Sure, let's do that. But but someone asked here, like, cause so all so all this thing when people say that casino dot you need casino dice for better security for Bitcoin private keys. That's that that's just, that's not true. That's just a stupid meme. It's fud. You don't need that. You, even if and, and I'll you don't need casino why. dice. No, that's that's just dumb. That's people. But they're pretty awesome. <laughs> I mean, sure, but I'll tell you why they don't. The thing is, like, imagine you have so a Bitcoin private key usually is 256 bits. Uh, have you bought casino dice? I've <laughs> tested casino dice. They're I've, pretty, they're like, they feel really nice in the hand. They chip very make, easily. You have to be careful not to roll them on hard surfaces. Why don't we make tungsten dice? That'd be cool, wouldn't it? That's that. Be... <laughs> Alex, have you tested tungsten dice? <laughs> I have not tested. Fair enough. I was just trying to say that that I think, the, the thing is that uh, uh, from a from a you can definitely measure. Sorry, I'm trying to say like for Bitcoin private keys, if you have crooked dice, you still end up with a secure key, so you don't need because you know dice. What if you like roll them enough times? Not even enough times. You so the thing is like so. Let's think about it like this. Let's say you have you say you use a 12 bit word, a 12 bit seed, right? Uh, which is 128 bits, right? Okay. okay. 12 so, words so, so, seed is 128 bits is what you meant to say. Yeah. Sorry, 12, what did I say? 12 bits. You said 12, you said 12 bit seed. seed, which is... <laughs> yeah, that, that's, that's Sounds horribly bad. insecure. <laughs> it's pretty bad. Okay, so let's say you have that, right? And let's say you have a, a dice. Let's say you have a coin or a dice. Or it doesn't matter, right? It really doesn't matter. 
that like thirty um, percent of the time it gives you bad beats. It it gives you the it gives you ones. Literally, it gives you ones all the time, right? Yeah. So Fine. then, it, so if you would have that, like, let's so thirty percent is like very like crazy. Thirty uh, thirty divided by a hundred times one hundred twenty eight. What is that? That's gonna be thirty four. So one hundred twenty eight minus thirty four. It's not thirty four. I'm not good at math on air, so I'm not going to attempt to help here. The, the point is that thirty is about eight, so whatever it doesn't matter. Thirty-eight, let's say. The, the point is that even if you have a a, a, a dice or whatever you want that's thirty percent bias, which is a crazy bias to have, by the way, you would still end up with ninety-four bits of entropy. Yes, exactly. Which yes. is impossible for anyone to ever crack. It's more than safe and whatever. So at some point, that's why it's a myth. But couldn't you have explain yeah. why this is not actually this argument is completely crap when it comes to nonsense, but this argument is good when it comes to private keys, yeah. But but right. couldn't you like couldn't someone on Amazon sell you like dice that just like roll <laughs> the same thing over and over again? Or like <laughs> roll is, is that is that even a thing or is that just bullshit? Was it you literally <laughs> what does this dice look like? <laughs> <laughs> Fixed every single time that you roll it. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Fair enough. Okay, okay. You, you open the subject. Okay, so if you if you still want to be paranoid, I mean, I have a fucking tinfoil hat on, and if you want to <laughs> test your dice, you should use some salt water. Again, just if you want. That's how the, the a lot of like um, dice people, or you can even buy a special machine. But easier, just get some salt water, uh, and you put it there, and then you just like give it a so so the dice is gonna float, right? Mm -hmm. uh, especially if it's because you know dice, and then you just like. Pop it just the tiniest bit. And it has to like, you're going to see if it's like weighted in, if it's like crooked, <laughs> you can see it's going to land on one face more than others. So that's how you can do that if you really want to. But it's, you don't have to, like it's useless. Like it practically, it does, it's just if you want to be autistic. But if you roll the dice more times, that's better. Yeah. Right? The more you roll, the better. But the, the, well, I, I don't know what that yeah. means because it's like, that's what is point. our algorithm? for using the dice, right? It's like, right. Yeah. so let's say the easiest algorithm is like when you have an odd number, you put a one, and when you have an even number, you put a zero, right? And right. you just roll 257 times. So it doesn't matter how much you, one roll gives you one bit, right? Right. Well, I hope that makes not, sense. Not, that's obviously not the most efficient way to use the rolls, but whatever. I mean, I yeah. yeah. Anyway, what's so, the, mo sorry, what's the, the more efficient way to use the rolls? Well, because you're not capturing all of the entropy of the object itself, right? The, the, the object has six possibilities. So it has, what's that, like two and a half bits of entropy. So if you only take it like odd or even, you're only taking one bit of the available entropy, right? So that's why you need to roll it 256 or seven or whatever times. Whereas if Right, you're, you're using it as like a coin flip instead of a dice roll. Exactly. So you may as well just use a coin, exactly. And then, then you'd be taking your coin into the salt water and then it would sink and you'd wonder what to do. <laughs> <laughs> but coins can be compromised, right? Like you could have a coin that only flips heads or... But that would be oh, obvious, I guess. Well, I, I even have a solution for that if you can believe it. Like I have, I literally have a hack for that. Like you can, I, here it is. I will generate, and we can even, I'll generate a private key with a coin you can make as bad as you want, and I'll put a thousand dollars there, and I bet no one can take it. I'm willing to do that. Okay, well, we should do that after the show. But anyway, um, <laughs> we kind of skipped ahead. I, I think we should talk about like the the yeah, history, I, I the history yeah. of compromises, basically. Yeah, it gives context, doesn't it? Because because it's easy to talk about theory, but if if we see practical right. reality, then then we might actually have a clue what to do. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't know. Well, um, oh, sorry, you're gonna say? Uh, I mean, BTC Pins has a question about pulling words out of a hat. Hmm. Um. My I... my original impulse was to wait until we got to mitigations. Uh, okay, but we can okay. talk about that right now because he mentioned it. So, so you you take all the BIP thirty nine words. How many words are in that word list, Alex? I think two thousand two zero four eight something like that. Okay, so you spend all day cutting out all of those words into individual pieces of paper. You put them in a hat. You shake them up. You pull them out of the hat. What's wrong with doing that? Well, so here's the thing right now. So the question becomes like, uh, uh, like first of all, is there a mathematical way which we can measure this, right? The, is there anyone who ever like measure uh, how good is this as a mixing method? And there's this guy called Percy Diaconis. Uh, he actually wrote papers on on 
on uh, how you can measure the efficiency of, of uh, what's it called shuffling dice, shuffle, not shuffling, but mixing dice and mixing all those things. And he said that the best method to, so if you have a deck of cards and what is the mathematical best method to mix it up is you have to do what they do in the casino. You put them face down on a, on, on a table or something. And then you, you do this thing where you're like, um, it's not stroke. But you like, you know, you do that with them. You move your hands around them. So you should do that. If you put them in a hat, I don't know what the shape of those things are and whatever. <laughs> I don't know how they would work. So, yeah. But this would be the, the best but, way if you're asking. But, but, but come on, guys. I mean, nobody's going to do that. And I think you kind of implied it with the way you questioned it. Man. Nobody's going to cut out 2,000 <laughs> different words. Nobody's going to cut See, but I think it, it, the, the, it's a trivial point. But there's also a deeper point, isn't there? Which is the practical... Um, inconvenience of the method is a huge factor and it could lead to all kinds it could lead to you not doing it right being sloppy something could go wrong just like simpler is always uh well i mean 100 percent. so yeah. like i mean i think this is a good bridging point to go into the mm -hmm. history of compromises because one yeah. of the main compromises i remember as a young bitcoiner is mm -hmm. before we had bib 39 so bib 39 was the Bitcoin improvement pr proposal that implemented this standard that we all know as seed words. So if you're a new Bitcoiner, you just entered Bitcoin and th there existed these seed words for backing up your wallet. These, these 12 backup words or 24 backup words that you keep safe, you don't let anyone see, and, and they restore your entire wallet for you. Those didn't always exist in Bitcoin. They were added after the fact as a standard. Now, before they existed, we had something called brain wallets. And the idea of brain wallets was you would put a word phrase in that you decided on and they would generate private keys for you based on that word phrase. And people all the time thought that they were being so clever yep. with, with what they were putting in there. Um, but they, there, there are people that out there that were just, they were running GPUs, they were running computers and they were just constantly trying all these different combinations. Um, and like a perfect example was uh, like poems or quotes, like people were using poems and quotes and they were just generating the people were able to generate the, the private keys from those poems and quotes. And, and they were just basically brute forcing it. They were just trying over and over different combinations of popular words and phrases and seeing if they could drain a wallet, if, if it, if it generated a real wallet that already existed. Um, as far as I remember that, People, everyone was just for some stupid reason using the same algorithm where they would take the the text and hash it with, you know, SHA-256. And, and then, so as you say, I mean, it, it was quite remarkable, even though we all understood that this was not very, or we, some of us understood this was not secure. But it was remarkable. They were they literally took like the whole of Wikipedia apparently, apparently and they, they just, they, they were able to hash every possible combination of, you know, phrases and words. And I mean, basically, obviously not literally everything, uh, entire dictionaries and like, they, they cleaned it out, didn't they? There was basically everyone who used any recognizable phrase got, got taken like that. Yeah, that was pretty bad. And then also another thing is unlearn to learn. It's a great name, by the way, is posting in the chat, the live chat via YouTube. Um, is he makes it's a it's an important point to mention is that when your wallet is is generating uh your 24 word phrase, your seed phrase or 12 words. It's really the first 11 or the first 23 is what it's generating. The last yeah. word is actually a checksum to make sure mm -hmm. that all the other words are um, valid, I guess, or like the order is valid. Yeah, yeah so the, but the, the thing is, like, most of the walls have a convention, and the first lexicographical valid one, if that's what he's talking about, is going to be suggested. So, but the last word's a checksum, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's checksum. correct. So, so if you're making them yourself, and I, we still need to get into the history of backdoors, compromises, and poor implementations, but if you're making one yourself, um, you basically have to, if you want to comply with the standard and use it in all the mainstream wallets, you need to then use a separate tool to derive the checksum, right? Oh, this was in the context of the, yeah, if you do it yourself, yeah, you have to know, you should go. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. Ed. Yeah. So Alex, have you done that? Like, how do you, how do you derive the checksum? 
Uh, I've done it on a lot of in a in a lot of ways. Um, I personally just like uh, you know, I I like to have an offline computer and do it pretty much. Yeah. So, but what I, what what do you? Is there a tool that you use to generate the checksum? Um, I don't. The only I've never time done I that myself. The only time I've did it, I wrote the uh, when I made that that random number generator, which was a, a fun project. I wrote this Python script that did all those things. So that's how I did it. But I think there's even the um, doesn't cold card have a, a Python script that you can use for that already or something like that, or yeah. someone. Or even Seed Center, I think, may have in the menu an option to do that. You just put all the words and they just spit it out for you. They give you the, the last word for the checksum. I'm not 100% sure. But some of what the wallets do that. Okay. Well, I'm not positive either. Waxwing, you have any idea? Um, I, I would say the, the reason this caught me a little unawares is because it, it would never have occurred to me to... Because I th always thought the, al the algorithm... And by the way, we... we we were talking about history. We should mention that, that it was actually Electrum guys, Thomas Burton, who first came up with this idea before BIP39, and they implemented it. A slightly different algorithm with some rather interesting code that ended up being changed later. But um, but yeah, but I mean, that's not what you're. That's not how it's supposed to work, right? I mean, it's supposed to work by you coming up with a source of uh, a master secret, the randomness for the master secret, and the, the words should be generated out of that. It was never intended, and I think I personally. I mean, I was I was sort of poo-pooing the the taking it out of a hat based on practicality, but as a more fundamental point, is you're not supposed to be coming up with a sequence of words yourself because that's dangerously. I mean, that's dangerously close to the old whole brain wallet thing again, isn't it? How many people might be tempted to come up with sequences of twelve or twenty-four words in this list that happen to make up a nice sentence, right? <laughs> uh, so, which is not what you're supposed to do, right? It's a, you, That's not how it's supposed to work. But of course, taking it out of a hat in theory is correct, except for, as you correctly point out, there's a checksum, which means you have to write, run software anyway. So blah, blah, blah. Right, so, I mean, we have we have ride or die freak young lurk in the comments uh, mentioning that seed signer will derive the checksum for you after you type uh, the first 11 or 23 words, depending on what length seed phrase uh, you use. And the purpose there of that checksum is if if the checksum isn't valid, before you even try and restore a wallet in most good wallets, it will tell you uh, this seed phrase is not a valid seed phrase. And it's a, it's just a way of, it's, it's just a, uh, like a mistake check, a gut check to just tell you, you know, you fuck something up along the way. Now, the passphrase, someone else is asking in the comments, the passphrase is, yes, it's the 25th word or the 13th word, depending on how long your seed phrase is. And that is just completely from you. There's no randomness involved in that unless you want to add randomness to that. And every seed phrase, every passphrase that you add, every, every time you change that 25th word or that 13th word, um, you're going to get a completely different wallet. Uh, so it will not show as invalid. Any any passphrase you put there will show up as a completely valid wallet. Um, and there'll either be funds in it or there won't be funds in it. Um, so it, as we've said many times on this show and on Rabbit Hole Recap, uh, it's, it's a nice plausible deniability feature because you could have one passphrase that has some money in it, but another passphrase that has the majority of money in it. And you can go down that rabbit hole you know, with 10 different wallets, you can go crazy on it. So that that's what that passphrase is there for. And what's nice about that passphrase is it just takes a little bit less trust. It, it mitigates trust a little bit more from whatever wallet you're choosing, because if for whatever reason we're going to, we're about to go through the history of backdoors, compromises, poor implementations. If for every reason that wallet is compromised and how they're generating your seed phrase, your private keys, um, they, if someone wanted to take your funds, they still need to brute force your passphrase because you're providing that. The wallet isn't providing that. Okay. With all that said, we're 44 minutes in. Let's get into the history of different compromises. Alex, I think you, I mean, your thread, the reason, one of the reasons you're on this show to begin with is you had a thread full of compromises. So you want to start us off? Yeah. Okay. So the thing is like, uh, I, the way how that thread started out is like I was listening to the Citadel Dispatch and 
and Matt uh, said that, you know, these are conspiracy theories that people try to compromise things. And I was like, oh, I have a lot of example where that's not the case. And uh, I, yeah, I conspiracy have- theory was the wrong word. But, you know, when you do uh, when you do 400 hours of Bitcoin content, uh, probably more than that, to be honest, uh, you misspeak a lot. But, yeah, continue. I was just being very autistic, of course. I mean, it was obvious what you're talking about, you know. But uh, I, I just wanted to, to, to write a thread because I spent so many times on this. But um, the thing is that, so the question becomes, do these things happen? Are these plausible, right? Do we have to speculate? Well, I don't know if you guys remember, but in 2013, Snowden leaked some documents, right? And there's this one very specific document um, that was that got a lot of people's attention, uh, and this is talking about a Sydney Enabling project. And what this project does, it says very, very clear, uh, like like th- there's no nothing to interpret that they are putting constant effort to. Um, uh, well, let me read it from here. It, it says this: insert vulnerabilities into commercial encryption systems, IT systems, networks, and endpoint communication devices used by targets. Influence policies, standards, and specifications for commercial public key technologies. Complete enabling for blacked out companies, encryption chips, and virtual private networks and web encryption devices. So it says pretty much that they that they've done that, and never mind they've done it. They have a program that they spent. I don't know. It was like the budget of a few hundred million or something. Per, per year budget to do this. So that's the first example. Uh, I have two more brief, brief examples. Another example is there's this company called Crypto AG in the 1970s, which is the um, be in Switzerland. Now in the 1970s, in the 1950s actually, that's when it was incorporated, cryptography looked very different. Everything was very analog and there was no open sourceness of everything. So there was this one company in Switzerland when uh, people uh, were, they were like, you know, Switzerland is neutral. So everyone buys their hardware from them. Well, the guy who, who founded the company, he ended up being friends with the guy who actually was the chief cryptologist for uh, NSA. And from 1960 until uh, 1970s, they backdoored uh, these things. So governments, governments were paying money to get backdoor, backdoor things. And here's where it gets even more crazy. From in 1970s, the CIA and the BND, which is the equivalent for the Germans, they literally bought this company 50-50 uh, under some dummy companies and they operated them like that until 2018 or something, so 2017. And they sold compromised hardware to governments around the world. Like, and by, Oh, and they were even profitable. Keep this in mind. Like these companies even made money. So I don't know, when, when these things happen and you see those things, it's like, it's kind of easy to realize that, hey, if they, if they did it then for these things, there's there's a hundred percent chance something somewhere is going to get targeted with bitcoin also so yeah so i mean obviously before bitcoin existed there was a massive war on encryption um that war continues to this day like the the so-called crypto wars has not ended yet uh We've won a lot of legal fights uh, in terms of protecting code as speech, um, but that war continues to this day. And the easiest way to compromise encryption standards or, no, it, it compromise the use of encryption communications or compromise Bitcoin is through compromising the sources of entropy or randomness, correct? Yeah, I mean, if you would want to compromise something, that would be that would be the best way to do it. Because and this is why, like something like Bitcoin Core doesn't use solely the chip in your computer that's designed for random number generation. Wi-Fi. Correct. Um. Sorry, can I, you hear me, guys? Yeah, we no, can hear you. I heard you say Wi-Fi yeah, as well. I, I, yeah, sorry about that. I just I had to find another <laughs> place. I mean, I'm in like the business center. It's the only place I could find. <laughs> I love it. I appreciate the dedication. Um, did you did you hear anything that Alex said? Well, I know he was talking about the crypto crypto RGA example and the um, and the NSA generally. I mean, have you got onto dual ECD RBG yet? Or but the thing is, these examples no. are like really interesting um, generally. But it's of course the question is how much do they apply to our particular. Threat model, of course. Yeah. Do they not apply to our threat model? 
Well, there's the sort of there's this whole concept in in you know amongst security researchers of the global passive adversary. You know, and it's a really the, it's a kind of a euphemism for the NSA, really. Or at least it was. <laughs> you know, this idea that somebody is basically hoovering up all the data and trying to like get a tap into everything going on. Um, I feel like that's quite a different thing from the problem of protecting secrets, like protecting credentials for specific. Um, things like Bitcoin. Um, it's not unrelated, of course. It's, it's a very it's a closely related concept, but it's not. I'm not sure if it's exactly the same thing, really. Well, like it's not like a crazy conspiracy to think, and like I'm not trying to fud them because they have a long track record of securing private keys. Mm. But um, something like a ledger device that's used by tons of people, and its only source of entropy is. I'm pretty sure a closed source chip. Right. So, so can I take this opportunity while my Wi-Fi uh, is working to yes. um, uh, put put out a, like put out my hot take? You know, my hot take about this topic, which is not uh, generally agreed by most experts in the field, but I I am quite against hardware wallets as a general. Uh, I'm specifically against them as being like the way, like it seems so common in the last couple of years for people to say to even like newbies, oh yeah, you take it off the exchanges and put it straight on the hardware wallet. Like that's the right way. Like that is the gold standard. That is the thing that every average Bitcoin user should be using. I'm not at all sure that's correct. I and My reason for saying it is specifically that it's obviously it's related to what you just said, but it's, but it's more just the general philosophical concept of, of central points of failure that and and also a, a concept something like steganography and, and if people don't know what steganography is it's the idea that there's one thing to hide like using encryption or some other technology to, to hide some secret but it's another thing to hide the fact that you're hiding and i think that um the problem with uh using a trezor or using a ledger albeit i'm sure they're great devices and i've, I've played around with them a little bit is that you're not hiding that you're hiding and everything is going through a very clear central point of failure. And if we're going to worry about NSA as a, as an adversary, for example, or, or the Chinese or whatever it happens to be, uh, that's, that's an obvious one. I mean, I don't think that really quite works, but it, it could, in theory, there could be some very malicious, very powerful actor that could get into those supply chains. Whereas if you buy off the shelf hardware and you work with things that are more custom, it might make uh, a lot more sense in the sense, sense that it has, it's not exactly steganography, that's not quite right, but it's, but nobody can, if nobody can predict that the device you're using is going to be used for that particular purpose, that's a huge step up. And that's why I advocate more the, the uh, cold, uh, the off, offline uh, laptop kind of model myself. Well, I mean, so the way I look at it, I mean, I, I think, I mean, everything has trade-offs, right? Yeah, and absolutely. You know, to me, hardware wallets are a middle ground. And hmm. most people will not go through the trouble of having an offline machine, generating secure entropy themselves. Um, they have a computer that maybe they've had for five or six years. They yep. use it for playing games. They use it for yep. searching porn. They, ha they, they have, a, oh, yeah. you know, their emails on it and stuff. Oh, we have they're... We hope it's not Windows, right? Yeah, most of them are using Windows. That's just uh, not the, not the some yeah. of them are using Mac. Very few are using Linux. Even yeah. fewer are actually securing their Linux distro in a sufficient mm -hmm. way. And a hardware wallet is a is a is a nice middle ground there uh, that is relatively easy to use. Now, the earlier hardware wallets, things like Ledger and Trezor. Now, Trezor has all open source components in it. Ledger doesn't. Both derive the entropy internally through their own processors. Uh, the newer generation of hardware wallets allow you to add additional entropy to them. Right, right, right. Things like cold card. Uh, the seed signer takes it to a step above that in a lot of ways. It does not have a secure element, so it's, mm -hmm. it's less... Um, it, it, it doesn't have a secure element, but it wipes itself is its strategy. So you have to re upload the secret every time they use a QR code method now to make that easier. Um, but the seed signer is completely off the shelf parts. It uses a raspberry zero. You can just buy that in, you know, a micro center or something like that with cash. Um, are most people doing that? Probably not. 
but there it's it's all about trade-off balances and there is a, there is another model i just want to mention it because it's something i haven't thought about for a long time but one of the first things i tried was using tails as a way yeah of that's what i've a, done sort of, too uh, yeah sort of a quasi second laptop you know but it's not really a laptop it's just something that's completely in ram and you just stick it in i stick it on a like a usb or whatever it was and you know it isn't clearly quite as good but you know, you could imagine various virtual machine-based models. You know, they you, they wouldn't stand up to an uh, academic rigor like somebody would say. Oh, look, this is still hooking up to the underlying operating system; it can still be hacked and blah blah blah. But it still has that nice property that it's you're doing. See, like you just said, that the the, the hardware wallets are a middle ground, and I totally agree with you. And your point is entirely valid. But the key word there is middle, right? So middle is a bit like the word center, right? Which is a bit like central point of failure, which right. is I think. So the two things go together. The fact that it is easier to use attracts everyone to it. So, and then you have this big kind of centralization uh, vector of attack. So um, before, anyway, before the cold card existed, before Seed Signer existed as a project my main way of telling people to do cold storage was tails. And actually that was before they even added Electrum. Now they have Electrum built into yep. tails. Correct. So you can have this Linux distro tails on a, on a USB drive. You can boot it up. And as soon as you pull the USB drive out, it's designed to wipe everything. So theoretically you could be using that with your regular computer, the computer you use every day. Now, if we're if we're going down the rabbit hole, really, you should be using it with a computer that's always offline that you don't use for anything else, and then just have the additional benefit of pulling out the tails drive. But it is pretty cool that they have Electrum built in. It does make it easier. You never have to. You literally never have to connect it to the internet. You can just securely generate a wallet, um, and then every time, just keep in mind that every time you uh, relaunch tails, you're going to have to put in put in your seed words again. Mm -hmm. I suppose another thing to mention. Oh, go on. No, no, I'm just going to start rambling. <laughs> no, no, ramble. We we have you well, on here to ramble. No, we love just, your rambles. I was just going to say that another kind of meta level uh, recommendation. Yeah, you know, we're talking about uh, recommendations. Is 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 that idea of like a second opinion, isn't it? So there's multiple models where I mean, one one counterpoint I've heard from people who are you know experts in the field. Uh, who who say you know actually hardware is not so bad. They they're often saying to me yeah. They take my point about the supply chain uh, risk, but they say, well, that's why you use multi-sig. And of course, that's a more complex, sophisticated model. So it kind of takes away partly from that selling point that hardware wallets have this ease of use, middle ground, you know, somebody can do, do it pretty straightforwardly. But so it makes it a little bit more complicated, but it has that second opinion element where if you have two devices, you know, if one of them is compromised, the other one's going to complain. And you can do, you can mix and match. You can do that with uh, an offline device or, or maybe a tail. You, you, you know, you know, there's, maybe you have two different ways that you think are kind of probably secure and you sort of try both of them and generate your, your addresses from your, your seed on, on both of them, for example. Uh, it's an idea. Yeah, I mean, multi-sig is clearly a uh, mitigation of the trust issues that you know evolve, uh, revolve around using a single hardware wallet vendor. Um, if you have something like a three of five, yeah, um, and you have five different types of wallets there, uh, you need three of them to be compromised for you to get compromised. Um, I would say that's probably like the next level of middle ground. Right. And then you get and then you could even get into using multiple offline mm -hmm. computers that are dedicated, you know, to the purpose and then have them be in multisig. And I would say, I mean, to I, I think with multisig, you know, like it's it's kind of it's like a relatively new niche within Bitcoin. Um, have people been doing it since like the armory days and, you know. Yes, like people have been doing it for a while, but it's starting to really evolve. And I, the ideal would be that, you know, in the relatively near future, in the next five years or so, it becomes even easier to use. And I mean, you have you already have things like Casa and Unchained where they hold your hand and they make it relatively easy to use multisig. Now you have a whole separate trade off there where you're trusting a third party completely with your privacy. Um, and in Casa's case i mean it's it's a closed source wallet app uh that also in a lot of situ i think in every situation holds one of your keys so i mean that's a whole nother trade-off but i feel like it's getting easier like we're not we're not quite there yet but it's 
it's relatively yeah, it's accessible. There's no doubt it's getting better. Yeah. yeah, and if you talk about like two years, even two years ago, I mean, it was a way, it was a way worse situation mm. in terms of using multisig. I feel like this is kind of like this whole multisig thing is like you you think in your mind that you should have a girlfriend for each need you have. <laughs> wants you to cook for you, wants you to do this, wants you to do that. But then again, you have ten girlfriends, and like I mean. You have ten. You have ten, ten. You have ten times more complexity, you know. And I think, I think these companies did a good job. Fair enough. But I also feel there's like the people on Twitter who need something. Like everyone needs to have an insight, right? And I think that a lot of people always search for an insight. And I think uh, a lot of people think this is their insight. Multisig says everything, you know. But I don't think necessarily is obviously the best. Well, I would say, you know, I would, I would say, if you're a public Bitcoin figure, which I am. Um, multi-sig adds an additional benefit that you can have your secrets geographically distributed. So if someone breaks into my house, not only do they have to deal with my guns, but they also have to deal with the fact that all my secrets aren't in this location, right? And they, they're going to need to go and, and get the secrets from those other locations and deal with that extra complexity uh, before they can steal your funds. So it's more than just mitigating the trust risk of whatever wallets you're using as the individual signers. I think that's perfectly um, valid for a case, by the way. But I'm tr I was I was trying to criticize as this being a solution for everyone, right? And, and right, I agree. Like for, for you, I guess, you understand I, very well, and you, you 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 were like, "Hey, I have a very I have a very specific situation, and my security is specially catered to my situation." But I'm, I'm, my, I guess my point was that maybe public figures on Twitter are more likely to be talking about it, sure, because yeah, enough, because yeah. it it suits their situation, right? And people yeah, tend to cool. get caught up. It's one of the things with this show that I'm I'm actively aware about that I have to remember that everyone's not in my situation, and I I need to make sure that I have content, you know, for people in completely different threat models, completely different trade off. Yeah balances that they're they're seeking but a lot of people don't right a lot of people just they're like this is the best thing for me so i'm just going to keep talking about it that that was my point can i can uh, i uh, butt in and answer a question in the chat from bill yes Fly? so he says Always. so memorizing so memorizing the seed is no good idea is is it not a good idea he's asking and uh, i think this is a, a common and important question um so you have uh, you have a, a set of words and obviously the intention of bit 39 and, and the former electron version was that uh, you have something that's human readable and at least in principle human memorizable and a lot of people will just immediately reject the idea they'll say oh if it's, especially if it's 24 but even if it's 12 words they'll say well you can't easily remember 12 words that's a lot of words that's a lot of lot of entropy to try to remember but the thing is um, the way the human brain works is the you know I remember I vividly remember in school an absolutely terrible Latin teacher who insisted that we would memorize the entire chapter of Caesar's Gallic War before each each lesson, which is absolutely ridiculous, but I literally did it. I mean, because the human brain can do that. It can memorize an entire chapter of text. Um, so memorizing 12 words is trivial as long as you use a simple mnemonic technique, such as uh, embed those words into a story and have that story have some emotional resonance for you, and then just repeat it a few times, and you will find you're actually able to remember it over a fairly, fairly long period. Now you'll get the counter argument, and I certainly got this from people like Greg Maxwell back in the day. He used to tell me, like, now that's don't do that don't do that because the human memory is very fallible you cannot possibly just rely on your memory it's a very bad idea and of course he's got a very good point so i think the the ultimate nuanced answer is no you don't just rely on your memory long term for your storage you have some kind of physical storage and we can get into like how you do that there's many ways but it's also very convenient that you have this um option of memorizing memorizing for example when you're crossing borders so i don't have to put anything on a piece of paper when I cross a border, let alone uh, carry a little device that looks like a calculator or whatever it is, right? Right. Um, so so I think there's a nuanced answer there. It's a very interesting- Yeah, I mean, and if you're memorizing it to cross a border, you only need to memorize it for 24 hours or 48 hours. Um, there's also a nuance there, like if you have clues or something. But like, I, I will speak from personal experience as a very paranoid person, um, that I have right now, I have four encrypted drives that I do not know the password to <laughs> because I thought I could memorize them. And I memorized them many times. <laughs> there was many times I entered it until I couldn't enter it, you know? And I still have the drives because I'm like, one day it might come to me. <laughs> um, and that's forgetting. I haven't had any brain injuries or anything oh, like wait, that. Wait, 
Well, wait, are there any private keys on those drives or is it just information? You know, X-Wing, I'm not quite <laughs> sure. <laughs> You're not sure. But that's my point, my point in asking, although it's a bit of an in, in, intrusion. My point in asking is that there's a certain incentive when there's there's money involved that you might... Yeah, there, there's a... There, let me put it this way, Waxwing. There's a reason why I'm still holding the drives. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> I haven't thrown them out yet, I, but so I, had, I have. I really have no idea what's on those drives. So you had a virtual boating accident, basically. It's all, all, all of your. Yeah, it's it's still there. They're, <laughs> you know, they're in my drawer. I just need to remember the password. Oh my god! <laughs> but no, it happens. Just... You know, you'll remember them until you don't. And if, 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 you know, NVK says a very good. He has a very good line that that you should when you think about storing Bitcoin, like you should be thinking. 10x the amount you're holding. And I would yeah. say that's even conservative, right? Because um, it's been way more than 10x since I first entered the Bitcoin world. Uh, so, you you know, it might not seem like that much. You're like, oh, I'm just setting it up. I don't need to write it down. I'll remember this. Oh, God. Yeah. It's, 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 it's more, it's, it's very likely that you will forget it. Uh, some people will remember it until you forget it. So just... At the very least, have clues. Um, when it comes to storing secrets safely, pen and paper is your friend. Uh, it's offline. Someone has to come into your home or office to, to access it. Uh, obviously, it's not fireproof or waterproof. That's where like steel comes in, stamping steel, stuff like that. Uh, to go back to the history of backdoors, compromises, and poor implementations, uh, one that I remember vividly Mm -hmm. was the blockchain.info wallet, which by the way, still exists. Do not go to that website. Do not use their wallet. Do not use any of their software. They're also blockchain.com. Do not go to that website. Do not use their software. Disclaimer, disclaimer, <laughs> disclaimer. They had a compromise where they were using random.org as their source of entropy. Correct, yeah. And it was serving a 404 error for a little bit. So all the wallets were derived from the 404 error. Yeah, I think it was actually 403 redirect, but either way, it's the same. Oh, principle. okay. <laughs> either way, it's the same principle. It's basically a fixed string, and they were just kind of hashing that. And, and, and so it was everyone was. The what's so catastrophic about that is I think that was private keys, not nonces, right? And that, that particular one. So it was yes. actually. Was it? So they're actually. Yeah, the just, one Max is referring to was private keys. Yeah, yeah. So does that mean they were giving everyone the same address or the same think... seed anyway? I think they had, did they have one other source of randomness, but it was like a bullshit derived source of randomness? At some point they were even, well, yeah, they were using random.org and that they didn't call anymore. But I don't think people were like, people were in opening wallets and they already had funds in them. It, it took an attacker. There was there was some nuance to it. Yeah, yeah, there was definitely a bit un, not simple, yeah. Uh, and there was a, around that same time, I think it might be slightly earlier, it's less well remembered nowadays, there was a, there was a bug where there was an actual weakness in the uh, secure random um, library in Java. And, and I think there were two or three wallets were hit by this where they were actually generating really insecure nonsense. Was the original Shieldback wallet compromised in that, I think? I think it might have been because it might have been Bitcoin JS, right? The, the, or the, the, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it makes sense to me. It's it's a bit unclear in my head, but because it was a long time ago. But that's the thing, Waxwing is like, like I understand the concerns around like hardware wallets or whatever. But before like we enter the hardware wallet era, yeah. I mean, like, do you remember like on Bitcoin Talk and Reddit and stuff? Like it was just you know like people like had log me in on their computer or they just had like a <laughs> virus on their computer or something and they were getting compromised. Like forget entropy. I know the conversations around entropy. But like, I, it felt like every day you would just open Reddit and it was just like someone got their wallet drained. Yeah, yeah. Like we, we've removed the low hanging fruit. Yeah. And now yeah. we can talk about, now we can go deep about securing your Bitcoin because people aren't losing their shit every fucking day over some ridiculous compromise on their computer. I mean, yeah, it's the, certainly... The, the the problem. I mean, maybe I'm aff affected by having tried out hardware wallets in the early days of, of that development, where you know you would plug it in, and it would say like, "Oh, just just fire up our web app," and then it would like, right. you know, and they'd have it would be some like mon effectively like seeing all your transactions, so privacy disaster, and then it would be like, "Oh, just update the firmware," and there'd be another ten right. firmware. 
and it was just like, oh, are you joking? I just, uh, the more I think, I mean, I actually went to the trouble of going to the Trezor offices in Prague to actually get my Trezor uh, in person playing for cash. So I try, I try to be like the good citizen like that. But um, of course you did. But even so, I didn't really trust i just don't trust the model but i do see the argument that it's well like the good package. ones nowadays like don't you don't use like a prepackaged uh software uh you know the firmware updates or at least there's there's pgp verification there i mean i guess like a hardware wallet the beauty of it is you can have like a hard-coded signing key and they can check it for you but uh, you're trusting them to check it um they're, they add additional sources of entropy. You're using, you can use your own node with it instead of using the centralized node that's tracking all your balances and your transactions. Um, so if we if we try and summarize like the historical aspects, apart from the whole NSA thing, which is that the, the, the I think the reason Alex focused apart from on, the elephant in the room. Yeah, well, I think the reason uh, Alex focused on that is because it illustrates the point that people say, "Oh, don't be a conspiracy theorist," whereas in fact the conspiracies are real. Right. right? Which, you know, I think that is a very important point to, to bear in mind. But in terms of like Bitcoin, it's been mostly like software flaws. Uh, it's user error in terms of generating keys. And I think it, the software errors tend to be more about generating nonces. And the reason for that is you have to generate a nonce every time you do a transaction, whereas a key is a one time thing. So it's easier. It's more an isolated thing to get that right. OK, maybe blockchain info was so terrible. They actually screwed that up as well. But maybe now it's, yeah. a, it's a good moment to actually start explaining this because yeah, maybe the, a lot of people yeah. don't even know this is a thing. Yeah. Or like, what Alex, if you start, the, you start the whole nonce conversation. And wait, wait, before it. we get there, before we yeah. get there, I want well, to make it completely clear. <laughs> I want to make it completely clear to the freaks. We have 20 minutes left in this conversation. I just want to make it completely clear to the freaks who are scared shitless right now. There's a lot of you out there. I know you're you're a little bit scared from this conversation. That strictly speaking, if you hold your own keys, ideally use your own node, but if you hold your own keys in any of the major hardware wallets, you're still better off than if all else equal. <laughs> I don't like speaking absolutes. You're still better off than keeping it in a custodial regulated exchange, right. custodial wallet. We have MZ fucking legend in the comments yeah. right now talking about Mt. Gox. Right like, point. like we have in the history of Bitcoin, if you hold your Bitcoin with a custodian, not your keys, not your coins. We say this a million times. It, it, can, it can get frozen. It can get stolen. You can lose it. The exchange can go bankrupt. Like there's, there's a lot of ways you can lose your coin if you're holding it on an exchange. So the first step before you get into all this rabbit hole, you, you, you got to hold your own keys and don't get, don't get too frightened from this conversation. Okay, Alex, continue. Um, yeah, so we were talking initially about the whole random numbers things, right? And it's like all we said here pretty much was that, hey, it's pretty obvious. And I think everyone knows, even if they're a novice, that you need those words to be random, and we stress this enough. Now, the thing is that the way Bitcoin works uh, is that you have these Bitcoins laying around on, that's not technically accurate, but go with me. You have these Bitcoin laying around on, on the blockchain, right? And you need to provide a signature to say, hey, I actually, this is a proof that, like you sign a check, that I have these Bitcoins and I'm going to move them somewhere else. The way this signature works mathematically, because it just works like that, uh, you need some a bit of randomness for this also. And uh, you probably some of you are going to think right now, well, we just got a new signature scheme with like Taproot and whatever. No. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. what we're going to talk is valid for both of them. Yeah. This specific aspect that we're going to talk yeah. about yeah. 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 Uh, doesn't change anything. So it's valid for both of them. Anyway, so the thing is that you what the signature pretty much does in a very dumb way, you just take, you also use your private key. You jumble a lot with, some other with this randomness and some other things and then when someone looks at this on the blockchain other nodes they're going to be like this is a valid signature and the thing is that signatures are made to function in this way and they shouldn't leak your private key that's why you use that random you know that's randomness to mix it together so you don't leak it and turns out there's like these very clever attacks that actually if you have so uh, I was I was actually made a really big case earlier that hey if you have a crooked dice and thirty percent of the dice it's right, like thirty percent right, right. of the entropy is bad like you're still gonna end up with a with a private key. It so happens that with the nonces 
like if you have even one single bit, I'm repeating this, one single bit of biased entropy there, someone could look at your um, at your signatures on the blockchain and they could steal your they could guess your private keys, which is pretty crazy. It's like it sounds like it's impossible when you think about it. Maybe Adam wants to. Uh, yeah. explain how this is happening and th there's actually a few variants on this attack not just the one with a bit but that one is the most uh yeah i guess scary yeah, so, so yeah so i think i think going back to first of all let's get the word clear so nonce is a word that's short for number used once and what is this number used once what is the purpose of it in the context of a signature well the purpose of it is simply blinding the very crude understanding of it is when you're signing with your private key you're kind of multiplying the message by the private key very crudely you're just taking the message and just imagine it in your head i'm just going to multiply it by the private key now if you pass that across to somebody as a signature it would be horribly insecure because they would just divide out the message and they get your private key so the purpose of this nonce is to add a blinding number just like if i give you the number if i have the number 13 and it's a secret but if i add 17 to it you're, you're just going to see like um uh what is that 40 uh, 30. <laughs> you're going to see 30, and you're not going to know the original secret was 13, be precisely because you don't know what that random blinding addition was that I did, that 17. If you knew it was 17, then of course you could take it away and get the 13. So the purpose of a nonce in a signature scheme is specifically to blind the, the output signature while still having that property that you're binding the, the private key to the message. And it's obvious from that description that I can't, well, it maybe isn't obvious, but it should be clear if you think about it from that description that if I tried to use the same nonce twice, so I signed two different messages with the same private key, but if I then use the same nonce twice, then by simple subtraction, I'd get rid of the nonce and I'd be back to the situation where I can just trivially ex extract your private key from the signature by, by taking away the messages. Um, if you work out the algebra, that's how it works. And so, like the like, saying yeah. twice is like a simplification, but if you do it like 15, 20, 100 times, it becomes no, even no, easier. No, no, that, no. That, in that particular case, it's not a simplification because the, the most basic, specifically non use yeah. here, specifically. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. the most, yeah, I was going to say the most basic example of, of, a, of a nonce failure, so to speak, is if you simply reuse the same nonce twice in different messages. Then it is the case because you've only used it, you've only you've got two equations there, and you can subtract out the nonce from the two equations and get the private key. Yeah, and just, just to add very quickly here before we move on, uh, there were a lot of well, by a lot of, I mean, probably a few hundred cases of when this happened. And there are a few yes. people who like did some research, and there's some papers there, uh, yeah. and they found this. And that is true, they were more like because these are implementation errors, pretty much, right? And this were happening more in the early days, more Correct. than now. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's the most basic. But so how problem. do you know the nonce is being reused? Right. Well, it's very simple. When, when you publish a signature on the chain, you're publishing two pieces of data. One is the actual signature, which is a, a number, a scalar number in, in the field. And the other, the other one is an actual elliptic curve point, like a public key. So what you actually, if you actually look at a signature, like an ECDSA signature on chain, unfortunately it has like weird extra formatting, but you probably already know that public keys are like 0, 3, da, 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 or 0, 2, da, 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 right? It's actually a pub, just like your public key for your, for your private key. This, this nonce point, we could call it, is the corresponding elliptic curve point to the, to the nonce scalar, the, the, the nonce secret. So just like your private key is not exposed by giving someone the public key they can't they can't reverse it and find it similarly when we publish the nonce point on chain you can't reverse it back to the original nonce from the public the public point nonce the nonce point to have you want to say it so if if but if you just reuse the same nonce just like if you reuse the same private key you'll get the same public key right if you reuse the same nonce you'll get the same nonce point so somebody so what these people did in the early days was they set up automated programs looking on chain or, or in the mempool anyway for transactions that were using the same r value which is the public nonce point as had previously been used as soon as they saw that they could just subtract the two signatures and immediately get the private key so it was vis it is visible on chain yeah, the, yeah, but do you see the subtlety is that it doesn't reveal the actual nonce secret value itself. It reveals the public key corresponding to it. So but, it reveals but, that it's been reused, but exactly, not exactly yeah, what it is. Exactly the same way as if I gave you the, the public, you know, it's the same private key. Even though, anyway, you get the point. So that's uh, the most basic example. Go, yeah, go ahead. No, no, I was going to say that, that actually MZ brought up something, but I think you're going to explain maybe then we should address the question. Yeah, I think before we before we do the deter that's a very important thing to discuss. Before we discuss that, let's just quickly. I just want to expand one little detail on, like, 
Alex gave you the bombshell, right? The bombshell is that the nonces have this horrible fragility to them, which is that even if you have slight biases, one bit, two bits, three bits maybe, in a nonce, that can lead to uh, this catastrophic failure where you actually get the private key just from the nonces, even though the nonces are only a tiny bit biased. And But I just wanted to just qualify that. Very important qualification to that is that that attack, I mean, it's generally called the uh, LLL, uh, it's... Uh, uh, hidden number problem is is how it's described, or, or also a lattice-based attack is another way to describe it. But this attack only works with lots of signatures. And when I say lots, it could be anything from like 20 to 30. Well, if it's a really extreme bias, it, you might only need 10 signatures. But if it's like a normal, like a few bits or 10 bits, you might need like 30, 40, 50 signatures. So luckily, even if somebody's got a very slightly bad nonce generator that it's random, um, if you only use the same key once, then it kind of by luck doesn't matter, right? So that's a detail, but it's an important detail. Now, MZ is making a very important point, which is everything we're describing about generating, not, that's not how it works. And part of the reason it doesn't work like that is because in history, there were a number of software failures leading to. One very famous example was a, a, a somebody we all know and love, Ryan X. Charles, managed to put... Um, this wonderful piece of code in, in one library or another that some wallets were using that actually generated nonce of 64 bits instead of 256 bits. So that's not like a one or two, that's one, one or two bits. That's like three quarters of the bits were all zeros. So as a consequence, uh, and this was found by in the paper Biased Nonsense by Henning, Henninger et al. But oh, that's a great name for the paper. Yeah, Biased Nonsense. Yeah, you can look it up. It was funny because when, when she published it, um, uh, I was on I was on IIC with, with Greg Maxwell and I, we were looking at it. At it typical Greg Maxwell was like, like oh yeah, uh, and, it, and it, I think it took him about one hour to figure out it was this one particular commit by Ryan X Charles. He found out which wallet it was because they were saying in the paper, we don't know which wallet generated these, but we found all these and they were all insecure and all the money was lost. And of course, it wasn't the academics that stole the money; it was some somebody else that had automated programs running looking for this kind right. of thing. Um, That's a anyway. name I haven't heard in a while. I remember when he used to be a hero to me before he completely lost his shit. Oh, yes. So we, yeah, those videos. Yeah, that's kind of interesting. Yeah, that is, that is something. Um, anyway, so what's going on? Yeah, so deterministic nonces. Now, this is where it gets interesting. What you can do is because it's difficult to do this right in software and because nonces are fragile, <clears throat> how about let's get clever and let's refer back to something we said earlier in the, the discussion, which was the idea of a pseudo random number generator. So instead of just thinking of a, a fixed amount of a, a random number, think of something that generates a stream of random bytes. And what we can do is create a, this pseudo random number generator based on two like bits of secret data, the private, well not one of them secret, the private key and the transaction message. And what we can do is go through a bunch of hashing, basically that's what is called RFC 6979. And we can output a nonce which and this would be the, the actual secret nonce. The output nonce would be a function of both the message and the private key. So nobody who doesn't know the private key can regenerate the nonce. But the cool thing is it means that this same nonce will be generated every time you have the same message and same private key. And it also guarantees that every time you have a different message with the same private key, you'll get a different nonce. And that's the property that's absolutely critical. You never want to have the same nonce on the same private key with a different message because that's when you're repeating the nonce and you lose all your money. Um, so RFC 6979 has become absolutely standard across all wallets used in Bitcoin since about, I don't know, 2015, 2016. Nobody uses anything else. But there is a little like fly in the ointment, which is when these new like music, music type uh, protocols get developed, we can no longer do which that we, for a reason. Which, which we just added functionality for. for. Uh, yeah, the taproot, yeah. The taproot, well, literally this really week. Like, in anything, yeah, music isn't really in anything yet. It's not even in libsec p, but but it's kind of like coming very quickly. So yeah. So anyway, so, right, so right now, probably you know, they're like uh, the people in the chat are like, okay, that was some very interesting, boring fucking technical detail. Why do I fucking <laughs> so, care? Sorry, you already told me. MZs, yeah, you're right, MZs. That's what I was. The long version of like is what you're saying. <laughs> no, no, but, but I, I I'm gonna steal man that. Okay. Uh, so, so so you're thinking like this isn't okay. That's interesting thing, but you already said it's fixed. So why the fuck would I care? right well now here's uh, the problem right now so let's say you get your hardware wallet all right which is you know it's a bitcoin yeah, hardware wallet. Yeah, yeah, and uh, you you say i i generated my so i i've done my, my job i generated with my own dice right 
but now you have to still make transactions. And now here comes the question. And I know this is again also a very esoteric attack, so keep that in mind. So don't get scared, but it could happen. Well, if someone intercepts your hardware wallet, they could specifically bug your random number generator in a way where it affects your nonces, right? So right now you don't know you don't sorry when when it's creating a transaction you don't know where it's getting this this nonsense for you know and the, and then this becomes also a different problem because so what if we have the standard how do you know the wallet is using it exactly and, can i just can i just reemphasize that sure, point? Go for it, go for it. people are not going to necessarily think of it but everything i just described is great but you don't know if the hardware wallet is doing it. you cannot know when you look at a nonce whether it was generated by rfc 6979 or whether it was generated by dice rolls or whether it's completely like evil generation you know, yeah. Well, like, is there is there like a a time reputation kind of thing that in, involves this? Like, I mean, people have been using some of these hardware um, wallets for years. Oh, so, like regardless, <laughs> so regarding this thing that I just said, uh, Stefan Snitriev, I think that's how I pronounce your name. The guy who um, Snigirev, Snigirev, I think is the Snigirev. Name. The guy, the it's guy an from, impossible uh, to pronounce name. But he's <laughs> awesome. He, 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 yeah, he, he's just great. The. Um, he actually wrote about this thing, had a blog post, and he even they even tried to standardize this a bit uh, and had some some posts or whatever. So, and there are there are a few ways to like solve this problem. By the way, even this one you can still solve it. Maybe yeah, Adam can, I, can, can describe can, the technical. Can I ex expand a bit on this because I, I'm go. running out of time and I want to talk, explain. It. So the the concept here might be. I mean, you talked about time. That's an important concept. Is um, you can get really sneaky with this. One thing you could do as an attacker is if you had control of the nonce generation function, instead of just having it spit out a key immediately, you could have it spit out a couple of bits of the secret data, let's say the master secret for your bit 32 tree, right? It could spit out a couple of bits every every transaction or maybe just one bit every 10th transaction. And it could be like over like three years, he slowly but surely gets gets your key. Once you're well, you know, you've spent a couple of months thinking, well, I'm not sure about this hardware wallet. Oh yeah, it seems to be working fine. I've done a few transactions. Now I'll do a few bigger ones. Now I'll do a few bigger ones. And he's waited like a year and then eventually he's got your whole key and you're, you're dead, right? So so just, you have to think like really fiendishly, like these adversaries. So how do we protect against this? It's a very non-trivial problem. There's a, there's a post on the a Bitcoin dev mailing list, I think by Peter Wooler, who went through several different ways you could try to address this problem. And it's a very weird problem because the whole concept of the hardware wallet is that the uh, you don't trust the um, the hot computer, let's say just, yeah, the online computer, and you're trusting the, the, the offline computer, which is the hardware wallet. But in this attack, we have to flip it around and we have to say, okay, I'm going to assume that the hardware wallet is, is, is an adversary, right? So how do we... So, so how do we deal with this? Well, well the, the general concept is tr just like you said before with a cold card, you take some randomness and you actually sort of feed it into the nonce, add it into the randomness that the hardware wallet is generating, whether it be RFC 6979 or anything else, but you add your own little element of randomness into it to make sure that overall that nonce is in fact random. Um, so it's things like, oh, there's a concept, concept called sign to contract and it's basically the idea that you take the hardware wallet's nonce and you kind of add you tweak that point with a hash of some data that you fed in. And then you have to have a protocol that sort of, um, how to say, verifies from the, 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 the software wallet side, verifies that that actual procedure was followed honestly. Uh, and I think I would recommend people read a post by Blockstream on, on Blockstream's medium. It's like anti-exfil, they call it, anti-exfil, because it's against exfiltration of the secret via the nonce. So the nonce is like a side channel if for people who know about that concept. Uh, but yeah, it's it's pretty advanced stuff. But that is that is an example of a problem that you can kind of solve. But the interesting point is if you read the whole blog post, at the end they point out that there's a fundamental sense in which you can never totally solve it. Because what can happen is if the attacker uh, sees that the output from this honest protocol to produce a properly honest nonce, if it produces a kind of nonce that they don't want, they can just abort the protocol and say, oh, so, sorry, there was an error. We can't say, sign that. So they point out in the blog post that even if you get really, really clever, you still have to take an approach of saying, you still have to be paranoid. Like if if the thing stops working or maybe it's maybe it's uh, an adversary, you know. Well, it's a personal responsibility thing. You should just always be paranoid. Um... Well, Alex, when was the last time an attack like this happened, a, a nonce-based attack? 
Well, the the thing is, like, we kind of like made them very general, but you have to they, like these nonce attacks are very specific. Like, even like Adam was saying, like, there's the whatever problem. There's even like specific attacks of the hidden number number problem, right? Yeah. That's so, one, yeah. yeah so, 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 so it depends which one do you mean? Uh, but that's. But can I just say that's where you should read bias nonsense by by. Uh, Henniger et al. because it's a, it's effectively a review and it doesn't even restrict itself to Bitcoin. It also covers Ethereum and LOL Ripple, <laughs> and it actually shows like over that they because they basically scanned the whole blockchains looking for weak nonces, and they found that the part of their summary is like we found like twenty four dollars worth of Bitcoin is still exposed and like twelve dollars of Ethereum. So essentially, all the the other examples, which they found quite a lot over several years, had already been taken. So be, people had programs running continuously. Uh, and some of the most obvious examples were like the ones I mentioned before. Secure Random in Java had a, a weakness in its um, its supposedly cryptographically secure random number generator, which wasn't actually cryptographically secure, which meant that once somebody has seen enough data, they could predict what the next values would be, and they could use that to extract the nonce. So, okay, that wasn't exactly nonce reuse, but there were, I think there were a lot of examples. And this is something you can trivially check by just scanning of people literally just reusing nonces due, due to a software bug or just due to being stupid. I don't know exactly. But it's it has happened quite a lot. I mean, relatively, I don't mean like millions, but you know, it has happened. You know, the idea was like, don't worry about this. But if you were having a conversation of like, what could go bad with entropy, this is what could go bad with entropy. And okay, so how could yeah. you, uh, uh, one way to limit this? Well, in order for someone to deploy this attack, they have to target your device. So get this hardware, right? I, I don't know, don't get, but this would be a way to mitigate it pretty much. So, guys, um, this has been an absolutely fantastic conversation. Um, we have a hard stop uh, that we've yeah. gone past. Um, uh, no, it's, it's okay. I'm, I'm, yeah, that's good. You're good. You're good to continue, Wax. Well, no, I mean, I'm good. To, I'm good to finish. Is what I meant. <laughs> okay, yeah, we're gonna wrap up. It's been a great. It's been a great conversation. Um, I appreciate both your time. Uh, let's let's end it with some final thoughts. Uh, Alex, first to you. Final thoughts. Final thoughts. I don't know. Uh, I don't know what to say. I guess you should just start being a bit more skeptical. That's what I would say about all these things and all this uh, this common knowledge that you have the that you get from people. Because I don't know. That's the whole point of Bitcoin. That's that's what I would Fuck say. Yeah. Waxwing. Thank you, Alex. Waxwing. Final thoughts. Yeah. Well, just um, be suspicious of third parties like central parties. Uh, be as because you know everything in our in our culture encourages us as consumers to just like do the easy thing, but but you know have a bit of gumption and, and do the do the hard thing. <laughs> there we go. But yes, thank you, Waxwing. Yeah, everyone, practice some personal responsibility. Uh, don't go for the most convenient answer, and uh, constantly continue learning. I want to thank all the ride or die freaks who joined us in uh, the live chat for this conversation. Very. You, you guys make this show special. Thank you to all the ride or die freaks that continue to support the show and keep it ad free and sponsor free. And a huge thank you to both Alex and Waxwing for joining us. Uh, it's It's been an absolute pleasure. I hope you guys come on again soon. And uh, Waxwing, thank you for coming on for your second time. You're, you're fucking killing it. And enjoy El Salvador. Yeah, thanks for, thanks for having us on, Matt. And I, I really appreciate it again. You just... Uh, straight away after you saw the thread, you were like, Astro, let's talk about this. So thanks. Yeah, for that's what that's what this show is about. That's why I do it. So thank you both. Cheers. Cheers. Looking out the window here, the ice cream truck tearing through the couch cushions, trying to scrounge up a buck. You know I'm running to get to him, but oh, he rolls away. Cause I gotta stay cool on a hot summer day. I got three quarters and two dimes. I got four pennies. It's all mine, and I'm walking on the street just to be seen. Looking so good, so fresh, so clean Yeah, say, man, don't be so mean All I got now are 99 cent dreams Running through the fountain on a late afternoon You know I always hear my mama calling way too soon Chasing after girls and try to make them holler Then I hear that bell ringing Find another
quarters and two dimes I got four pennies it's all mine I'm walking on the street just to be seen looking so good so good so clean girl say boy don't be so mean all I got now are 99 cents walking on the street just to be seen looking so good so good so clean girl say boy don't be so mean all I got And I have the fence Can't get the words out But I'm just in time With my quarter still a jingling I'll get what's mine I was yearly living life carefree Not a worry in the world from a bill or a girl <laughs> Homework was the main concern And with 99 cents I had money to burn Looking for a block party or a barbecue Who said balling out was impossible And I could do things that was hard to do A quarter water plus chips and a Charleston shoes <laughs> It was more the kid like every yawn Looking for a girl like a move heavy yawn In the vein of Christina Milian But with more echelon and some pink jellies on Now, not some average misses Someone I could play run catch and kiss with. Back then, kid, please believe this. Only thing me and Eli would need is three quarters and uh -huh. two dimes. I got okay. four pennies. It's all mine. Oh. I'm walking in the street just to be seen. Looking so good, so fresh, so clean. When I say boy, don't be so mean. All I got now are 99 cents. Walking in the street just to be seen. Looking so good, so fresh, so clean. When I say boy, don't be so mean. All I got now are Love you, freaks. Thank you for joining me for another dispatch. I will see you on Rabbit Hole Recap on Thursday and another civil dispatch on Tuesday for another Bitcoin Tuesday. We have a great lineup next week. We have Eric Sirion, the lead maintainer of Simple Bitcoin Wallet as well. That's not Eric Sirion. And Fiat Jaff. And we're going to be discussing Charming Mints on Lightning, this idea that you can have a privacy preserving trust minimized custodial wallet that has easy UX and can interact with the rest of the lightning network. Um, it could be a very special conversation. I am looking forward to it. I love you all stay humble stack sats. Cheers. <laughs>